Okay, we're ready to start our session. We'll turn it over to Jack Kleinens. Good morning or good afternoon for all of our attendees, depending upon where you're located. Uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, keynote, uh, uh, keynote speaker for this session, the end session for the Economic Measurement Seminar, which is in our 18th year. Uh, president Esther George was the Chief Executive and President of Kansas City Bank, and she's had a sterling career with the Federal Reserve System and in Kansas City. Before we get to her remarks, I just want to also thank the bank uh, for their participation and support over the years for the National Association of Business Economists, as well as the NABE Foundation. Uh, we had our annual meeting in Denver back in 2019, and uh, we've had participation uh, recently by Megan Williams of the o uh, Oklahoma branch in one of our sessions back in 2017. And we've also had a stalwart to NABE who was uh, at the Kansas City Fed, uh, George Kahn. So thank you, uh, President George, for all the support. What we're going to do over the next few minutes is, is um, have uh, President George speak on her topic today of is the economy tight or slack? And then there will be a follow up uh, by me uh, moderating uh, some questions that I have already prepared. And then we'll also try to uh, take questions from the audience listening in. And so without any further ado, uh, President George, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have you and welcome you again. And um, th the show is yours. Well, thank you very much, Jack, for the introduction. I wanna thank you for inviting me to participate in this year's Economic Measurement Seminar. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of your program because as your group will well appreciate, measurement and data are central to monetary policymaking. I think of data as the vocabularies that policymakers use to build narratives. Those narratives are essential for making sense of the economy and of course, for explaining our policy decisions. We also know that data alone can't tell the story, but the story certainly depends on the data. And for that reason, the same data can often underpin widely divergent economic narratives. As a policymaker, those narratives are shaped not only by an assessment of the data, but also by experiences. And so wisdom and humility to adjust a narrative is essential, especially when we see data that make the story increasingly difficult to tell. So today I'm gonna to take a look at the data and narratives as they relate to a particular question that I think have very important implications for monetary policy. And that question is, is the economy tight or slack? The strength of demand and the ability of supply to meet that demand, of course, have been significantly affected by the pandemic and the related policy response. When I talk to my contacts in the Kansas City Fed region, I often hear anecdotes from them uh, that suggest the economy has run into constraints. I hear reports of the difficulty they're having finding workers, of having to pay much higher prices for materials and transportation. And of course, their stories are confirmed by the data where we see a record number of unfilled job openings and sharply higher prices for many commodities. At the same time, almost 6 million fewer individuals are working now compared to before the pandemic. And this suggests that there remains considerable slack in the labor market. So is the economy tight or slack? I think prices are telling in making this assessment. An economy that operates near or at its productive capacity is likely to display higher prices. And on the other hand, slack implies underutilized resources such that higher demand can be met without increased prices. So I thought what I would do today is really explore some of the factors that I think are currently contributing to a tight economy, which of course is lifting inflation. And while there's good reason to think that many of those factors that are boosting demand and restraining supply are gonna fade over time, the extraordinary events of the global pandemic make this unfolding narrative, I think a complex one not the least as the course of the virus remains uncertain even today. 
Importantly, policymakers like me have to consider not only near-term, but also long-run implications of their policy choices and be prepared to adjust as the economy evolves. You don't have to look very hard today to spot signs of an economy that's run into constraints. Our business surveys report a record number of job openings. Workers are quitting jobs at a record pace which typically is a sign of a hot labor market when people see they have alternatives uh, and that those are plentiful. And not surprisingly, many firms are telling us they're raising wages or that they expect to do so soon. Strong demand and limited supply are also apparent when we look at depleted inventories. The inventory to sales ratio for retailers is at a record low and far below historical norms. The rundown in inventories has been particularly notable in the automotive sector, where the day's supply of available vehicles for sale at just under 30 days is less than half its typical level. So this combination of tight supply and high demand are of course behind the recent increase we see in price inflation. Prices as measured by CPI, came in today at 5.4% over the 12 months ended in July, which matches June's increase and remains at the fastest pace of increase in over a decade. Of course, when we look at that number to be sure, some of the increase in prices simply reflects a reversal of price declines that were recorded earlier in the pandemic, particularly when you look at service categories like airfares and hotels. But the normalization of some of these prices is not the whole story. Other prices have moved far above pre-pandemic levels. The sharp increase in car prices has been widely reported, not just as it relates to new cars, but also used cars and even rental cars. And indeed, durable goods more generally have experienced large increases in prices, sometimes at the fastest pace in decades. When we look outside of consumer prices, there also has been a sharp rise in commodity prices and transportation costs. So if you base uh, the evidence that we see here, you would say the economy shows clear signs of tightness. An important question though related to that is, will that tightness persist with implications for the path of monetary policy? Whether we judge the economy as temporarily tight or more persistently tied is gonna depend on the evolution of the dynamics, of course, that affect both supply as well as demand. Currently, demand is exceptionally strong, boosted by expansive fiscal policy and low interest rates. It's also unbalanced, favoring the consumption of a subset of goods. Supply, on the other hand, is constrained by frictions in the labor market, and production bottlenecks resulting from kinks in global supply chains. There's reason to think that some of these drivers boosting demand and constraining supply are gonna fade over time. And I wanna talk about four aspects of that that I think could introduce slack into what is now a tight economy. And I'll go through those four factors and also include as part of that, thinking about some of the risk around that outlook that include the possibility that the economy could feel the, feel the effects of this most recent uh, resurgence in the virus around the Delta variant. So let me start with one of those factors related to demand. And again, notwithstanding the upswing that we see today in the virus, I expect that we'll see continued rotation of consumption from goods to services. More than a year ago, you and I were forced to avoid contact intensive services, things like hotel accommodations, concerts, amusement parks, even going to the doctor and dentist um, and hairstylist. And stuck at home, people rotated their consumption toward goods often ordered online. This led of course to a very uneven pattern of demand. At the end of the first quarter of this year, Services consumption was still 5% below pre-pandemic levels, while the consumption of durable goods was a remarkable 34% higher on the same basis. This unexpected shift in demand toward a subset of consumption goods has been behind some of this observed tightness in the economy. 
For example, the purchases of household appliances in the second quarter, things like refrigerators and washing machines, were running 12% above the level at the start of 2020, in part as the pandemic set off a wave of home remodeling. Reports of long delivery delays proliferated as demand ran up against supply constraints. And not surprisingly, prices for major household appliances have surged, increasing 14% in the 12 months to June. With the advent of widespread vaccination and a lessening of pandemic disruptions through the spring, we saw services consumption pick up and goods consumption begin to step down. Still, services consumption remains depressed relative to previous levels, suggesting that there's further room to grow. So as consumption rotates from goods to services, some of the pressure should ease for overstretched goods demand perhaps allowing inventories to rebuild even as services growth continues to support the overall recovery in the economy. The second factor uh, that I've mentioned is the likelihood that the growth of overall demand should moderate as some of the government supports that people have received begin to fade. The tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus provided to the economy since the start of the pandemic on the order of some $6 trillion has been essential in supporting economic activity. However, much of that stimulus has already been distributed with the last checks to households going out at the end of March, the payroll protection program for small businesses closing to new applicants. So the peak boost to growth from fiscal policy has likely passed. Some estimates show that this fiscal policy effect after adding almost four percentage points to growth last year could subtract about two percentage points from growth over the next few years. Of course, there's additional spending bills on the horizon. Some of that could blunt this drag, but they don't seem likely to fully offset it. A third factor that focuses on some of the supply side considerations that are contributing to near-term tightness in the labor market um, and materials markets. I'll start with labor supply. Here we see temporary factors related to the pandemic are likely contributing to some of the tightness in the labor market and some of the anecdotes that we hear. Importantly though, we still see depressed level of labor force participations. So we think about the disruptions to schooling and daycare that led many workers with small children, especially non-college educated women to drop out of the labor force. We also know that enhanced unemployment benefits could also be playing a role as some workers sit on the sidelines and assess their options. But as schools reopen and as these enhanced unemployment benefits end, these constraints on labor supply should ease. Already, we're seeing some of that with promising signs that the labor market is in fact healing. Just uh, last week, the July jobs report showed that the unemployment rate is dropping below 5.5% as the economy added close to a million jobs, even as the labor force participation rate remained almost 1.5 percentage points below its pre-pandemic level, suggesting that there's further room for recovery in our labor market. And the fourth and final thing I would mention here is that supply constraints, of course, go well beyond labor markets. We've seen a number of materials and inputs to production have also experienced bottlenecks, notably things like semiconductors and steel, but other aspects of production have also been affected as well. In part, these shortages reflect the difficulties of restarting or reorienting production after a year of sharp shifts in demand. The bottlenecks have also arisen from domino effects related to the tight logistical networks that were in place pre-pandemic. So with a flexible dynamic economy, firms can be expected to overcome most of these bottlenecks, I think, through the rest of the year. This narrative for why the current supply and demand constraints might be expected to ease over time strike me as a reasonable baseline. My own expectation is that growth will step down but remain robust, that the labor market will continue to recover, 
and that inflation will moderate. But this narrative would be incomplete without recognizing the risk that are around these assumptions. And um, obviously one of the key risks that we're all watching today has to do with the lingering presence of the pandemic. The upsurge we've seen in COVID cases, um, while so far are not showing up in the data, they could increase caution on the part of consumers. They could delay the recovery uh, across certain dimensions of our economy. And importantly, I think we have to remember the effects could be as pronounced on the supply side as the demand side, meaning we could prolong the tightness of the economy and maintaining upward pressure on prices. Renewed concern over the virus could impede the recovery in services consumption, such that demand remains directed toward those sectors of the economy that are already near capacity and away from those sectors that have available slack. The virus could also delay the normalization of the labor market, particularly if schools and childcare um, are disrupted in some way. And we're already seeing the spread of the variant in parts of Asia. Uh, where vaccination rates remain quite low, could have disruptions in the manufacturing sector there and spill over quickly to other parts of the world. That, of course, would exacerbate production bottlenecks and shortages, as well as inflation pressure. Aside from those threats related to the virus, though, the assumption that demand will moderate, of course, um, is another risk, and it could, could prove otherwise uh, to the extent that we see a high level of household savings today. In particular, a considerable portion of the stimulus transfers to households have been saved with estimates suggesting that the stockpile of household savings has increased by close to two and a half trillion dollars. Of course, healthy household balance sheets are important. They're positive for the economy and to the degree that saving is spent out over time, this could support steady and strong growth for some time. On the other hand, if households choose to spend rapidly, we could see a burst of demand that could keep the economy at capacity, reinforcing these bottlenecks and putting continued upward pressure on prices. So households have a lot of firepower right now, and if and how quickly they choose to spend it will be an important factor in how tight the economy remains. So what does all this mean for monetary policy and for the FOMC's long run objectives uh, for the economy? Uh, how do policymakers account for today's tight demand and supply dynamics in their decisions about the path of asset purchases and interest rates? And I'll turn to that now. If you go back to the FOMC's meeting in December of 2020, the committee stated that it expected to keep the policy rate near zero until the labor market reached levels that were consistent with maximum employment and inflation had risen to 2% and would be on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. The FOMC also expects to maintain its asset purchases of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities until substantial further progress has been made toward those employment and inflation goals. And I think without question, the combination of fiscal and monetary policy support, certainly at the onset of the pandemic, bridged our economy's transition from a deep contraction to one of robust uh, rebounding. Now, with the recovery well underway, a transition from that extraordinary monetary policy accommodation to more neutral settings must follow. So today's tight economy, as I described earlier, does not call for tight monetary policy, to be clear. But I think it does signal that the time has come to dial back the settings. With year-over-year -year inflation running well over the committee's target and steady progress in monthly employment gains, the FOMC's long-run objectives for price stability and employment are clearly in focus. While recognizing that there are special factors that account for much of the spike in inflation, the expectation of continued strong demand, a recovering labor market, and firm inflation expectations are consistent, in my view, with the committee's guidance regarding substantial further progress toward its objectives. And I support bringing our asset purchases to an end 
under these conditions. As this adjustment gets underway, public attention, of course, will naturally turn to the timing for when the committee might adjust its policy rate. Though it's important, I think, uh, to remind people that the timing of tapering asset purchases is not mechanically connected to the timing of any policy rate adjustment. With both upside and downside risk in play and multiple policy tools in use, judging the achievement of criteria for raising rates is a more complicated um, situation. One might argue that today's inflation dynamics are likely to keep inflation moderately above 2% for some time and clearly align with the committee's threshold criteria. On the other hand, the criteria for judging maximum employment are murkier. While it's clear that we remain far from historic low levels of unemployment that we achieved pre-pandemic, it's less clear to me that that benchmark is gonna be the best guidepost in the current expansion. The pandemic has introduced a number of frictions in the labor market, many of which are likely to evolve over time. And barring further intensification of this virus, I would expect those frictions are gonna fade, promoting strong job gains and a relatively fast approach to maximum employment. However, the experience of the past year may well have resulted in a number of structural changes to the labor market, including how, when, and where people work. And those changes could affect the assessment of maximum employment in ways that are not yet entirely clear. As witnessed during the last expansion, we know it can take some time to draw individuals back into the labor market. And that, of course, isn't an argument for keeping rates unchanged, but making sure that accommodation adjusts as the economy expands so that we avoid imbalances and instability that can undermine those kinds of gains. So I'll wrap up here, Jack, by saying that uh, the road ahead to policy normalization is likely to be a long and a bumpy one as we navigate these inflation and labor market dynamics in a post-pandemic economy. I think it's also important that we keep in mind the importance of financial stability as we try to achieve these goals for the economy. And so along the way, a careful assessment of the data is going to be essential to shaping the narratives that will guide policy decisions, balancing nimbleness and patience, and steering clear of policy errors. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, uh, Esther. Um, it's, it's uh, again, a pleasure to have you today. And uh, because we have participants from really across the United States, I thought it might be helpful uh, for our attendees, could you just briefly describe in general sort of your district in terms of uh, primary industries? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, the Kansas City Fed has uh, one of 12 regional districts. We sit uh, largely in the middle of the country and we serve a seven state region. It is a big geography. It is one that has many rural spaces uh, to that geography. And its economy really is driven uh, by a couple of things. Obviously, you would think about agriculture, and it is certainly important to this region, both the production as well as ag-related industries. Um, energy, so oil and gas extraction is important to this region relative to the nation uh, as a whole. And as you can imagine, being in the center of the country, rail transportation and other forms of transportation um, fit naturally as a driver of our economy. But really across those seven states, um, you see a lot of diversity ranging from scientific research labs in New Mexico uh, to tourism to uh, the ag and energy uh, sectors that I mentioned. So big geography certainly influences uh, as we build an understanding of the economy. That's where we start. It really is a large geography that you represent. Um, as, um, as you know, this seminar focuses on economic measurement, uh, hard data and soft data. Um, and early on in your talk, you talked about uh, data alone cannot tell the story. Uh, you did mention a few uh, major indicators, but I'm wondering what 
uh, might be on your dashboard of indicators that you look at on a regular basis to evaluate the economy and monetary policy? Yeah, so you might think for an organization like the Federal Reserve, who has a couple of specific mandates around employment and price stability, we're going to be looking at data that really tells the story about how are we achieving those mandates. But that, of course, can be far reaching. And so uh, we here at the bank have constructed a labor market conditions index that incorporates some 24 different variables to arrive at how would we judge activity in the labor markets? How would we judge the momentum as that labor market uh, changes over time? So we're looking at some of the same data, of course, that everyone is, but I will tell you, you mentioned soft data. And when I talk about some of the narratives around data, one of the really, I think, important aspects of what a regional Fed president does is have contacts in their community. So when I go out and talk to business leaders, talk to people in the community that are serving others, you get a very uh, real-time sense of what's happening in the economy. And that gives us context to go back and look at that data and say, is what we're hearing corroborating the data? Is it telling us that there has been a shift and we should begin to look for other trends in the data as it comes in? So those two things taken together really provide, I think, a very helpful and uh, rich perspective on how we think about the economy. Great. Um, you mentioned in your, your talk that the economy has run into constraints. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we got a reading on the second quarter GDP. I'm curious, uh, was that a surprise to you? And um, uh, to what extent does that change uh, your uh, estimation going forward in the second half of the year? Yeah, I wouldn't say that the numbers were a surprise. And I think by that, uh, you made the consensus, I think, was looking for something a little bit higher. But by and large, I think what we see is that uh, demand is strong. And you are seeing that uh, show through even in the second quarter GDP uh, number that we reported. So as I look at how things are evolving, I think uh, we are on, tr on track to expect that the economy is going to continue to grow and to grow at a pretty healthy uh, clip uh, through this year, we may certainly see uh, things begin to step back as we go forward. But as a baseline, um, I think it's encouraging. I think that number tells us that we're on track. And you also talked about employment and uh, we had a fairly strong release uh, last week. Um, to, to what extent does it concern you or what, uh, what might be challenges as we, uh, and you mentioned in your, in your speech, uh, you know, bringing back people into, uh, into the workforce. Um, is there any sort of other issues that could be uh, really of concern to you in terms of uh, the equity within the employment ranks in terms of who's getting jobs, who's not getting jobs? So I think that's looking for full employment, maximum employment, of course, isn't a specific target. It is really um, trying to gain a sense of how many moving parts are affecting that labor market today, which ones are going to be most affected by the Federal Reserve's policy stance, and looking more broadly at what I call some of the structure elements of that workforce uh, that will change. So in addition to seeing a strong job number for July, obviously we all know one number uh, doesn't uh, set your trend, but we have seen a succession of pretty good numbers there. I think watching to see once we open up more fully, and by that I mean, We've seen the services sector not quite get back uh, where it needs to be. And yet you hear employers uh, really expressing concern that they can't get those people in. So some of that dynamic, I think, is going to take a combination of things uh, to begin to ease up there. And I thought last month's report was sort of an indicator that maybe that's beginning to happen. People are retiring. Um, and their decision about whether they come back into the workforce at some point 
whether some of these jobs uh, that uh, people have open are being affected by things like unemployment benefits. That I think is just gonna take us a little while longer. And of course, as we see the virus pop its head back up again, that might complicate our timing and trying to read through those data. So you brought, brought up retirements and I've read somewhere recently that the estimation it might be uh, approximately 2 million baby boomers retiring uh, this year. Um, doesn't that impact what our view of what unemployment might be? Uh, and as you're thinking about what the target is, uh, I think um, uh, the uh, unemployment rate is under the SCP is like 4.5% in, in long run, I, I can't recall. But um, does that mean that we might need to reevaluate what the unemployment rate is in terms, or uh, I guess that, that's my question, I'll follow up with another comment. Yeah, no, I, I think one thing we've known is the demographics um, are gonna affect labor force participation. And so we can kind of map out a trend line that says, um, based on those demographics, based on the baby boomers retiring, we should adjust um, how we understand labor force participation might look. And I think we've done that. I think what we see today is maybe an acceleration of some of those retirements. Um, and so eventually that might come back to the trend line. So that, uh, my point is implicitly built into, I think, my own forecast for unemployment um, and that of others. I think. Really, it's a question of, will any of those retirees want to come back into the workforce at some point? Will that help us uh, fill some of these jobs and what other dynamics might get in the way of people that are sitting out for other reasons and not participating in the workforce? I have just a few more questions and then we're going to turn over to some of the questions that are coming in, Esther. Um, I have a question for you in terms of our inflation fears inflated. You mentioned that firms are reporting um, raising that they've had to raise uh, wages. Is, is there a possibility that inflation expectations can be self-fulfilling in, in this environment? Do you have any concerns that we might get into some kind of an inflation wage spiral sometime in the near future? And so as my comments uh, pointed to, Jack, I think right now, because we see such prominent dynamics around a period of high demand and these constraints, that we'll want to see whether those work their way out. There certainly is, though, I think, and, and policymakers have to keep their eye on inflation expectations. We do see firms having more pricing power than they would have uh, five years ago, even two years ago. And the public is certainly more aware today of inflation, I think, and we just hear that in the anecdotes than they were before. So, it is something that I think policymakers have to be very focused on is what expectations are being built into the future. And um, we know those could move quickly. Um, and so that I think will very much be in the fore of uh, my own thinking about how the economy is evolving. Let's stay with inflation for again, for another moment. How do you interpret the use of the word averaging above 2% in terms of a period of time? Is it uh, a period of a year, uh, three years, five years. I think everyone is, you know, asking that question and understanding how monetary policy is to be conducted. Yeah. Of course, the committee was quite intentional, as you know, in uh, adopting a framework that uh, talked about average, that it was not going to be a mechanical measurement, that it wasn't going to be a rule. It would really be a framework. And I think as I judge how to think about average inflation, which you're really trying to express here is some symmetry around inflation. So uh, not that 2% would be a ceiling to that. We know that number can move around. What I'm hopeful for is, you know, over the past decade, the public hasn't worried much about inflation. And I think that's a good state of affairs. I think as we watch going forward, uh, the committee will talk about uh, an average in the context of what's happening in the underlying economy, what's happening with expectations to really arrive at what really serves the interest of meeting our mandate around price stability relative to all the factors that might be affecting that inflation number. 
Uh, one more question for me, and I'm going to go to the, some of the Q and A's. But you did in your uh, in your talk speak about the health of the consumer, and that was a reward, rewarding feature. Um, you know, you've been uh, in the world of looking at uh, the financial institutions, uh, their safety and soundness, and from a consumer standpoint, you mentioned uh, their health. Is there any cracks in sort of that? Uh, that proposition that you made, any concerns within any particular part of the consumer spectrum that you're you're worried about or we should all be watching closely? Yeah, so a couple of things there, Jack. When we look at household balance sheets right now, and I, I make the statement that overall they're healthy, I think, first of all, you have to remember um, that's an aggregate measure. There's sure. certainly people that are struggling uh, there are there are some consumer balance sheets that do not look healthy that aren't sitting with an abundance of savings uh, in their bank account. So um, that condition, of course, um, segments the economy. There are different underlying dynamics uh, that we have to pay attention to and understanding how the consumer is faring. Uh, as it relates to uh, you mentioned cracks. Obviously, I'm one that, uh, because of my background in thinking about access to credit and thinking about risk management, um, looks carefully at the prospect that our ability to achieve our mandates for employment and price stability depend on a stable financial system. And so there are many aspects to that uh, that stay in focus for me in terms of making sure that uh, lending standards um, are good, that asset valuations are not uh, going to stretch in a way that could create vulnerabilities to our economy. So all of that goes together in judging not just the consumer, but the broader economy's ability to sustain the kind of growth uh, that we need going forward. Well, as a follow-up, I just thought of another question related to that. I mean, we've been seeing an acceleration in house prices. And of course, the Great Recession of over 10 years ago, we got into some uh, real difficulties. Uh, any comment on the housing market, housing prices? Because that's certainly part of the net worth of our consumers. Yeah. No, we hear this across the country. I certainly hear it in my region. Um, the the uh, movement in house prices has really been um, a factor, both in the froth that we see in that market, how quickly houses are turned over. We know we already had a problem with supply relative to demand there. Uh, we've begun to see some of that uh, backing off, whether it causes other problems for us down the road. Uh, I am more encouraged when I see underwriting standards, at least in the residential markets, um, have continued to hold pretty well. But that doesn't change the dynamics for people that uh, have to afford a home, that want a home, uh, and the ability to get in there. So that's uh, certainly an aspect of our markets today that is showing um, excess, is showing stress in a way that I think we have to pay attention to uh, the underlying stability uh, in that sector. So um, this is related to one of our questions, but it, uh, it was also a response to your comment. You mentioned that additional spending bills uh, under consideration could blunt uh, the drag uh, on, the, on the economy. Um, is the Fed watching the congressional debate over the uh, debt ceiling and could it uh, stalemate in, in, in increase the debt ceiling, disrupt financial markets or possibly real economic activity? So we always watch. We're not uh, oblivious to that. I rarely comment because those uh, those decisions are ones that are made by our elected officials. And so um, mostly I go back to look at history to say what have been the impacts of those. And I think we can expect, uh, depending on how those debates unfold, we might see similar kinds of uh, impacts to our economy. Uh, broadening the lens of your discussion today, are there any thoughts on uh, trade relationships with China or internationally that might risk a growth or create more tensions within the economy? So again, uh, trade policies um, are a component of a broader look at how the, the global uh, economy is working. 
I will just give you as one reference point. When we look today in my region, uh, the outlook for agriculture has really shifted. The past five years has uh, been one where we've seen farm incomes depressed. Today, you see commodity prices for grains really uh, picking up, providing some breathing room for some of these farmers. And when you look at what underlies that, uh, some of that is related to trade where uh, some of those sales are going abroad. So those can have puts and takes uh, uh, in different parts of the economy always a factor when we look at the data to understand what is it that's affecting um, uh, industrial production, what's affecting uh, demand in our economy. So uh, obviously with your background in uh, evaluating and monitoring um, financial institutions, we have a question here, what is the largest risk to financial stability right now? Is it policy adjustment or is it speed? Uh, not reading the economic conditions right or people's expectations and market reactions uh, to conditions. So I'll, I'll repeat that. Uh, what is the largest risk to financial stability right now? Is it policy adjustment or speed, not reading the economic conditions right, people's expectations or market reaction? So I suppose it could be all of the above, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that multiple choice uh, test. I guess one thing I would point out, the Federal Reserve um, uh, has been uh, providing a report on financial stability that uh, it makes public. And I think in there points out uh, certain vulnerabilities to the financial system and to other parts of our economy. Because again, going back to my earlier point, the conditions on which the Federal Reserve is able to achieve its objectives depend importantly on stability economically and within the financial system. So when you look at vulnerabilities today, uh, when you see stretched asset valuations, um, again, as a former bank examiner, that always raises a question to say, when and how do those adjust? And do our banks have the capital buffers in place that allow them to absorb those kinds of inevitable shocks, does it transmit to other parts of the economy? So watching those vulnerabilities carefully, knowing what the mitigants are around that uh, have become an increasingly important part, I think, of the FOMC's conversation. And certainly looking at the board's financial stability uh, assessment is an important part of that. Well, Esther, it's been uh, a great pleasure to be talking with you today. And I wanna thank you for your time uh, and your expertise for today, as well as I've mentioned in the past, the bank's support for the National Association of Business Economists. I hope you'll consider our invitations in the future, and we hope to someday also return to your district uh, for our meetings. I At hope this, so. Thank uh, you. Uh, you're welcome. So before we close the, uh, the TV screens here, I, I have a couple of uh, just uh, reminders, and again, I um, uh, want to thank everybody for uh, attending uh, today's and yesterday's and on Monday's economic measurement seminar. I want to also, in particular, thank the staff and the committee and all the speakers and panelists that I think made one terrific uh, 18th year program. Um, I want to let everybody know that's tuned in that uh, you will be receiving in, in, in a few days a link to a conference appraisal uh, via SurveyMonkey. And so please take the time to uh, fill that out and give us some suggestions for sessions for next year or actually webinars that we might do throughout uh, the next year. And finally, um, I want to mention, uh, everyone, that uh, we will be having another session at 2 o'clock Eastern time today on uh, maintaining the quality and integrity of the U.S. government uh, statistics. We have the heads of the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the head of the Bureau of Economic Analysis, as well as the uh, head of the Census Bureau. <clears throat> And uh, this session will be moderated by our uh, friend, uh, Washington Post uh, correspondent, Heather Long. So with that,